introduce the just a little bit of the background. Um, uh, so, as you're aware now, we're going to be um, hearing some work that emerged from an elective module in writing called Writing Place, um, and it was focusing on place. Um, the writing of place through close and careful observation, um, 14 students in fourth year and fifth year um, in Seoul. Um, and so the, the opportunities that the writing process offered in terms of looking and understanding further, uh, recognizing important knowledges that we have of our surroundings, places we encounter and finding ways to articulate those uh, through writing. Um, and the sort of slow pace involved in the writing process helped this the revisiting and the reworking um, and allowed um, sort of uh, the, the writing process was able to inflect the understanding of the place um, before any design proposal might be made um, or alongside the process of design or entirely separate, um, which is maybe the case um, for uh, maybe half. So students were encouraged um, to choose between up to three places. So Limerick City was an option and um, the locus or um, site of their thesis or studio design project um, um, or the place where they had grown up or spent a significant portion of their lives. Um, and in some cases, all these three were the same place um, or overlapped or two. So there was kind of a range. And so um, each day we read, I'm gonna share the screen here, so now. Um, yeah, we can yeah. see it. Right? Okay, perfect, yeah, perfect. Um, so we read um, a, a number of writers, two every day, um, between fiction and non-fiction writers, um, for whom place sort of forms a significant part of their work, um, whether that's overtly described by them or not. Um, so we looked at Kevin Barry, Sarah Baum, and John McGahern, and um, uh, the others listed here, Mahon McGann, I always struggle over his name, Robert McFarlane, Tim Robinson, Darren McAnulty, um, Darren Ugrifa, and Nan Shepherd, and then three philosophers um, who have a significant focus on place, Gaston Bachelard, Edward Casey, and Jeff Malpas. Um, and so a, a small reading among Saul has become sort of this larger thing involving um, a, a number of other um, uh, hopefully students, there might be some from UCD today. So the invitation today is to close your eyes when um, uh, when you're listening, I think, when you can switch off your camera, um, it just to allow to allow you to hear, I think. Um, there's be one photograph per student um, as they're speaking. The photographs are not central, so the visual isn't central. And um, in most cases, it's it's an aside to the to the process of the writing. Um, and so um, we're with a number of guests today. And so I'd like to introduce you to one another and to the students um, uh, who might offer some response or thoughts if it comes to mind um, at the end. So we have Tracy McAvenue, um, who's a PhD uh, candidate in the Department of English at UL. And her interest actually in her PhD, I probably will summarize it uh, poorly, but th there's an interest in space in certain uh, uh, writers, Irish uh, writers in, uh, within, uh, within Irish literature. Um, with James Lawler, who um, the students have met before, um, so James is the regional director of Narrative 4 in Limerick, um, uh, uh, and we participated, um, James facilitated a morning workshop um, in um, the story exchange methods for Narrative 4, um, operates mostly amongst teenagers and young adults, um, um, with an idea of radical empathy. Um, is behind that. And uh, we have Emer Tynan, a landscape architect um, from Mayo, but living in uh, um, Oslo um, and uh, uh, teaching um, in uh, Tromso in the Arctic and her um, interest uh, again in, in space and uh, coastal space and Arctic space. Um, and Marcus Donnelly, I think will be joining us later. I can't actually see the full screen now, so I can't see who's here or not. I'll have to figure that out. Um, but Marcus Donaghy um, as a Donaghy Diamond Architects and um, I had invited somebody else, but I'm not sure whether she's made it. So um, it's open to you to respond at the end. And, and if there are students um, outside of this, it might be an interesting conversation on Wednesday. Um, so I will be reading on behalf of a student who is quite unwell at the, at the moment. So Shane, the second person on the list. So when you hear my voice, um, that's, uh, uh, that's um, I'm in place of Shane. So Mason, whenever you're ready, you can um, work away. Thanks, Anna. My name is Mason. I'm a fifth year student at Saul and for the Writing Place elective, uh, my focus was on my home village of Doolin. The way I structured my writing was through three chapters, uh, all exploring a different scale of the village, but at the same time exploring a different level of consciousness. So the first chapter is titled Micro, the Shell. It's very much explores the subconscious. The second chapter is titled Median, the Flesh, and that looks at Doolin at a human scale and the, the conscious level. And then the last chapter then is titled Mega, the Spirit, which would look at the 
the ever conscious and at a grander scale. So today I'm going to read a piece from the second chapter, Median, the Flesh. It's a little extract and I'll get into it now. Closer to the road in the adjacent field stands a sizable construct, what I now know to be a lime kiln. An admirable landmark, it has been the subject of many photographs of tourists who have chosen to pull in af and after their quick snap, dispose of rubbish in our bins, much to the dismay of my father. For years, I puzzled at this construct and deduced that it was good nature of the farmer to build a shelter for his cattle. I now know the kiln long predates the farmer and although dormant from its intended use, it serves the heifers when seeking refuge from the occasional Atlantic downpour. Apparently the white rhino has pushed the lime kiln to extinction, how paradoxical. Onwards, I march over the road. Three houses passed, the next is my grandmother's. The new house stands in place of the old stone cottage that sported thatch roof. Smoke bellows from the height and a half chimney, a turf fire. I inhale deeply as if it were a sacred incense. There's no doubt that smell is by far the best induction of memory. The rare occasions we are met with these coveted scents, we must enjoy them, for there is no way to store them like a photo or a record. The ritual-like deep breaths allow me to recall the blacksmith's tongs, the weight of them as a child, and most vividly, the clack. The squeal of the stove door opening and then click, clack, click. What a satisfying sound. Now a highly sought trophy, among other sentiments in her will, its fate it has yet to be decided. My aunts and uncles competing in order to grasp at a fragment of their childhood. I don't blame them. I continue my journey past the house and head towards the four crossroads, towards the Ironview filling station. Now a gentle walk. This was a pilgrimage I have completed in repetition, only measurable by counts of dairy milk chocolate bars and feast ice creams. The spoils of a completed mission in the acquisition and delivery of 20 silk cut purple. It often puzzled my young mind why my grandmother would always smoke the same cigarettes. I certainly wouldn't eat the same chocolate bar for the rest of my life, for variety is something to be enjoyed, but I suppose different strokes are most certainly for different folks. The crossroads, known locally as Garrahy's Cross, is an important moment in the village. It's the special place at the top of the hill where you get the first view of the sea and also a sense that you have arrived in Doolan. What exactly delivers this feeling? Perhaps it's the sea in the horizon. Perhaps it's the tourist trap sweater shop that nonchalantly begs for the patronage of a passing traveler. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I am sure the sight of the ocean stirs something within all who gaze upon this view. A feeling of excitement in the belly and a primal urge to seek water, like that of a toad's impulse to find a pond. I must descend. Turala, Turale. So, I'm going to skip ahead now to the final piece in that chapter. And it is at the terminus, uh, which is uh, right at the, the seaside, the ocean. I have come here, as I have many times before, to speak with myself through proxy of the ocean. The sea does not judge. It merely advances and recedes like a lateral pendulum. I am not afraid to throw my voice, as I know it will be lost within the churning, the, the churning tides and some days the land speaks back to me. Whatever way the wind blows through the cavities and crevices, it can produce a note or even a series of notes with which one can mistake for the hypnotic melody of a siren's song. I am not a man of altars or angels. This is my church, the here and now, the sea and sky, who have listened to many men before me, who wait for many to speak hereafter. Thank you. I'm going to read on behalf of Shane McCallion. Uh, so the title of Shane's piece is The Lure of the Land. And this is the second of three pieces of writing that explore memories of particular places that had an impact on him. There's a focus on the relationship of nature and land to himself and to the built environment. So the piece uh, today that I'll read on his behalf is called A Hint of Rare, Warm Evening Life, Light. And it's about an experience that begins in his home on a dreary winter evening in County Sligo in the northwest of Ireland. A hint of rare warm evening light pokes its head into the room and sits down beside me. The encroaching darkness had convinced me the day was done, but the light perks me up. It tempts me outside with its warmth. 
Curious, I pull back the heavy polka dot curtains, red and purple spots on white. Some of the cushions match. Peering through the suddenly window down our long windy driveway, across the road, over the estate houses, up the rolling foothills and through the pine woods, Knockeray stands proudly above our seaside village. The land slopes gently from behind her, rising to the wide flat peak where Queen Maeve's tomb li lays like her crown. The warrior Queen of Connacht, her sheer limestone cliffs face up to the harshness of the Atlantic Ocean. Stiff pine trees grow up her side until the height becomes too much. On days like today, she hides in the clouds, but the rare warm evening light has found her. Below the lowest clouds, the sun spreads its final rays. Across the limestone cliffs, along the rows of pines, over the rooftops, down my long windy driveway and into the room beside me. It's tempted me outside. The enticing light gives me urgency. A brisk 30 minutes will get me up the mountain. If I leave now, I'll get the last light. Even the comfort of my soft knitted throne, I wrap myself up to brave the cold. The dog has learned that hats mean walks. He bounds to the front door and produces the dog's equivalent of a purr. If I take my time, it turns into a bark. The driveway in our front of our bungalow is long with relatively fresh paved tarmac that is slowly starting to show its age. Hints of moss and algae are fond of the places where puddles tend to form. An impressive bouquet of palm trees is nestled on the bend nearest the house, a native plant to the seaside bungalows of Ireland. The wind struggles to carry away its heavy fallen brown leaves. They lie on the mossy lawn until the mother tells me it's time to gather them up. Sam, our golden brown rough collie, is little less interested in the palm tree. He's busy pulling the arm off me. Bred to herd sheep in the Scottish Highlands, he enjoys our expeditions up the mountain. I've made the short but steep ascent dozens of times, if not more. There's a certain attraction it has. I never make the trip solely for exercise or to walk the dog. I could do that anywhere. On top of the mountain is a special place. It is calming and inspiring. Spatially, it is liberating. Ascending the timber pathway through the dense pine wood holds your perception and experience within your close surroundings. The breakthrough moment when you reach the top and emerge amongst the low-lying heathers is liberating. There are particular moments when this place is best experienced. One of those is when the rare, warm evening light catches the limestone cliffs on a dreary winter evening. Like striking a match, the sun's light illuminates the place. It has an inspiring effect. This particular place is fleeting as it interacts with the light. From on top of the mountain, I can see the sand dunes erode against the relentless Atlantic. The ephemeral quality of place becomes even more clear from this perspective. As quick as the light appeared, it is gone. Storm clouds roll in from far out above the Atlantic and all of a sudden this place is not the same. This place offers me liberation, it inspires and calms. It is a place for reflection, contemplation and contentment. The, abil the ability of this place to affect is certain. I'm not sure I would be the same without it. Hi, how's it going? Um, my name is Charlie and my piece is uh, titled Reading Water. And it's, um, it's looking at how water contributes to the creation of place. And the piece I'm going to read is focused on uh, Fina Beach, which is a beach uh, where I'm from in County Kerry. So, um, beach in County Kerry is Fina without a rocky beach on the seaward side of a narrow tombolo, which connects Fina Island to the mainland. It is named to differentiate it from Fina within the smooth sandy beach on the lagoon side. At the south end, there is a low-lying headland which bears the brunt of the ferocious northwesterly Atlantic storms. In order to protect their land from further erosion, local farmers have constructed a rudimentary sea defence system using large pieces of masonry and concrete from demolished buildings. Over time, the sea has worn down and scattered these slabs of concrete and masonry across the foreshore so that they now sit amongst the smooth pebbles, beach stones and seaweed. Some pieces are difficult to spot as they have been worn smooth by the relentless power of the waves. The only thing distinguishing them from the beach stones being the fine texture of their exposed aggregate. Other pieces are more recognisable and give clues to their previous function and nature of construction. It is possible to tell where a floor slab met a wall due to the regularly spaced pockets 
of marginally different colored concrete along one edge. Partially exposed rusted rebar protrudes from what was once columns and beams. Chunks of masonry lie half buried amongst the stones and sand with their mortar joints strongly accentuated by the partially erosion of the blocks. The sea has revealed the beauty of the material. Stripped off the outer layers of paint, plasterboard, insulation, ceilings and flooring, the slab's smooth exterior has weathered away, revealing the mosaic of the aggregate. The stones of the coarse aggregate are blue, grey, sand and purple in colour, appearing pale and unassertive in the overall composition of the slab. These discarded pieces of buildings sit amongst the materials from which they were made, and through the unrelenting power of the sea, they are slowly returning to being stones and sand. And now I'm just going to skip to the, the last section of this piece, which focuses on the sea. The winter ocean has many moods. November to February brings a succession of storms from the west and northwest which cause violent winds and large seas. Between the storms are periods of slightly less strong, but still powerful westerly winds and choppy seas. Occasionally, a blocking high will sit over Ireland and we get cold, crisp blue skies, no wind and dead calm oceans. The sea becomes the void of movement. Instead, it is a single unbroken plain stretching west to meet the still blue sky. In this state, it can appear almost solid. For a fleeting moment, it seems possible to step out onto the sea and walk across the bay to the Mahari Islands, and maybe even keep going west across the ocean to Newfoundland. Too quickly, however, the immersion is broken. The blocking high moves, southwesterlies pick up creating small ripples, which soon become short, violent chop. And if the storm grows, a high rolling swell with white caps. The sea is once again returned to interminable motion. Hi, Harry. Um, I'm Fionn, uh, also a fourth year student um, in Seoul. Um, I wrote two kind of shortish pieces along the same lines. Um, the overall piece is called Remnants, it's like both of them are kind of, one is situated in Ennis, which I'm studying as part of design studio, and then the other is Galway, um, where I'm from, um, but they're both kind of about pieces of history or physical pieces of stone or concrete or whatever that are kind of left in these places over time and how they changed and how those places changed. Um, the one about Ennis is kind of one of my first interests is in those kind of, gravestones and in the graveyard, um, like all these stones have been moved from their original position. They're all just kind of stuck into the ground or part of a floor, or part of a wall. Um, and I suppose I'm just trying to figure out what they represent now. Like, are they still connected to the death or to the life that they were supposed to represent in death, even though they've been moved or changed or worn away? Um, in, in typical Irish fashion, the rain comes and goes before you have time to find decent cover. The sun begins to breach the clouds as I walk through a tall stone gateway onto the holy grounds. I gaze upwards at the skyline of the church. The roofless southern transept greets me. Behind that, a gothic bell tower juts out of a recently restored chapel roof, each peak added 300 years apart. Patches of a reflected sky are scattered over a carpet of grass. A small trench-like cut in the soil reveals the cornerstone of the transept at its original foundation. The hallowed ground of the graveyard has swollen with the addition of so many bodies over such a long period of time. The medieval friars who founded this order lie below the last king's atonement, who in turn lie below doctors and merchants from Victoria and Ennis, all becoming part of the same ecosystem as they decompose into nothing. A gravel path leads me past these patches in the grass. Most are heavily worn by the rain. Here lies the part of this earth, 1765. Amen. 
The green grass creeps over the dark edges so that most of the glistening faces have soft, uneven borders rather than the hard, straight lines of cut stone. The rising ground and slow destructive force of time has swallowed up countless stones along with their stories. A second burial for some, so that nothing remains of them in the material world. The stones which were unceremoniously exhumed are the lucky survivors. Their stories for now live on. Up ahead along the path, one of only a handful of stones left standing is a highly decorated piece by the stonemason Michael Flynn, who signs his work with a flourish just below the main inscription. The front is beautifully carved. The main inscription sits beneath a scene of a crucifix above an altar, flanked by a herald angel and a hooded woman holding a chalice. The back face is filled with a large decorated cross, quartered by two bodiless cherubs and two carved urns. The foot of the cross is sculpted into a skull and crossbones, which sits above a beautiful poem. Could skill in art could virtue save the owner from an early grave, he would have lived and sweetly smiled to love his wife and bless his child, but crushed by death away he flew to meet his God at 32. Behind these carvings, a small burial plot has been allocated for the modern day friars, modern day friars who remain working in their new church on Francis Street, built in 1892. This is the only part of the graveyard that is still in use today. Facing these dead friars on the other side of the gravel path is a monumental rust colored stone. It is meticulously carved. Each of the deep cut letters are submerged in shadow, standing out starkly against the sun kissed rusty face. The stone speaks of James Robinson, a sergeant in the 5th Regiment of Foot for the RIC who lost his life in the execution of Judy in the small town of, in the small village of Clondagad, just south of Venice. He died in May 1831 two months into the explosive tithe war, likely one of the very first victims. Standing watch over this stone is the delicate five bay eastern window of the nave. A matching trench cut at the cornerstone of the significant eastern wall shows the now hidden depths of the original foundations. I walk back along the foot of the nave wall towards the transept. Where the southern wall meets the ground, a row of tombstones make a flat stone skirting which separates the wall from the soil of the graveyard complete disregard shown for the sacred east facing axis on which these stones are originally placed. This edging continues along the nave to wrap around the foot of the ruinous walls of the transept. My feet encounter a collage of stone and concrete as I make my way from outside into the roofless transept, which acts as a foyer for the chapel turned museum. Here too, pools of reflected sky disrupt the rough texture of the concrete floor. I tiptoe through the veins of poured concrete that fill the gaps between randomly placed tombstones, only to lose concentration and catch myself suddenly standing on the name of a long dead resident of Venice. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shannon Ryan. Um, the piece I wrote, I call it, or entitled it, uh, Pursuit the Beauty. Um, it's a memory I have from um, very young actually and um, I'm sure you all have those kind of vivid memories of when you're a kid with your parents. Um, I used to live in a place uh, called uh, Kilmac Thomas in Waterford which is a uh, close to a beach called Bunmatton Beach and um, it's where my mother always used to bring me to you know, play and stuff as a kid and uh, there's one kind of very vivid memory I have so and um, that's kind of what I uh, wrote my piece on. Um, I have it uh, split into four sections or four chapters and the first set is fleeing towards fixation, the next the juxtaposed imagination, third return from beauty. And um, so um, the first uh, piece I'm going to read to you is the opening paragraph of the first chapter. Um, so it's kind of just where this memory begins in my mind when I uh, think about it. So um, <clears throat> I waddled a pace from my pursuer down a towering slope. Beams of warm setting sun navigated its way through passages of a sea spit. The crevices and voids of this towering grey stone headland that cloaked the, what lay beyond it, levitating. These dense clouds of natural bubble, bubbles hurtled past me, objectiveless, only dancing in the swirling winds of this sheltered little beach. An out of rhythm skip joined by my ever accelerating waddle with excitement. The almost laser-like beams of sun extruding the headland chasms, diffracting the agglomeration of dancing bubbles upon us, 
as if a kaleidoscope of color, like little rainbows poured over us. You could see the man-made biting in the cantilevering rock of the headland. The former roots of aged structures climbed the cliff wall like a vicious ivy over what I can only imagine was the inner port wall of this headland that once was heavy with circulation and logistics. The apparent past places of timber stairs and rope pulley lift, memories lived on as grassy, weedy trails have took their place. Through my yet still innocent eye, it held the form of a giant jungle gym, climbing so high to the top would easily escape peripheral if the course of your direction was so stubborn by this erupting ocean of shiny white bubbles on the beach shore. Um, then I'm going to skip forward to um, the last paragraph in, um, in my third chapter uh, called The Juxtaposed Imagination. And um, this is kind of... I guess it's looking at like the happiness and um, nostalgia can uh, carry upon you, but also sadness it brings because of nostalgia's memory, isn't it? So um, this is only a short extract, but um, can you remember the last time you just played, just running around and hiding with your friends, wrestling for the top of a hill? Pointless games with pointless fun that now sadly seem pointless to you. When this does, when this ends, it is a sadness not spoken of enough. And um, that was the end of that chapter. And uh, now I'm going to bring you to my uh, closing paragraph of my whole piece. Um, it's in the, chap or in, the par or in the chapter, Return from Beauty. So, um, shrunken now to my original three foot something, worn by my mother's sheeting arm, we turn now on firmer ground of the spit. Engulfed by the elderly tide only a short time ago, so peaceful we begin to stroll. Lobsided as it seems, as if only yesterday, I would stand on my tippy toes, praying my grand would say I was taller. I could feel the sand spray against my ankles as the velcro straps of my baby gaps brushed against one another step by step. The glimmer and shine of the new moonlit sky emblazed the shellac purple tones of tiny white shells compact flat into the sand. A match for the beauty of the sky, but almost hidden into irrelevance. The moonlight's observant glare also caught the immersion of the occasional air bubble. Their slow infiltration of inevitable return to a structural estate, like dim flickering stars on the ground. Leaving behind them, I, I, <coughs> sorry, leaving behind them a delicate passage, funneling between the granules of a sandy palette for their next breath of air. The short-lived hyperspell of excitement in the sea and air had grown tired now and laid calm and motionless. Only the most distant and softest waves could be seen to disrupt the stillness of the sea or of the flat sea. A giant blank canvas, negative, painted on it, the magic of the sky and its gentle tones that lingered so wonderfully from the slow sunset, slow danced on the swaying horizon. An abstract and inattentive brushstroke floated over all of it. A new beam of light that followed us over the endless canvas as if walking us home. I could see the remnants of its light in our footprints, small pools all the way down the beach, as if it became a memory to the moon too that we could share. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Patrick Ryan. I'm in Fort Year and Soul as well. Uh, this text is called A Place in Time. The first part of this text is a record of a moment that played out in the mountains in my surrounding area. This moment started a lifelong alteration in the way I see change, time and place, seeing them as one. This thinking is continued in the later part of the text, which I will read now. I'm at my happiest, detached from reality, in the presence of any life form from an insect scurrying around and struggling to make its short time one of value to the large, looming, kind figure of a tree that stands on the edge of the field, surveying it for hundreds of years. Time is different for them, slower for the tree, but the blink of an eye for the insect. It is this difference in perspective that has made me aware of the change and the changing. It is very evident. It is present in two different timescales the abrupt and violent weather that is in, in the timescale of my life and the opposing timescale being that of the gradual erosion of the mountain. I consider it a privilege and a responsibility to have a grasp of the concept of time, 
To me, it is what makes our species capable of the great feats that surround us. It is therefore imperative that we keep time in consideration when making decisions that affect the place we all live. We can no longer make decisions with a lack of foresight and empathy. Each act must be regarded as, as if it were a stone thrown into a still pool of water. The ripples continue to advance long after the stone has vanished. This way of thinking seems to be vanishing in my place. What used to be a vibrant community of farmers and stories is now reduced to a handful of farmers' sons who seem only to be concerned with efficiency and profit. I long for a time where these sensibilities and the, way, and the ways of old combine, making farming a way of life again rather than an occupation. This change from old, slow farming to the fast and efficient has, alter, has altered the way everyone perceives and, affect, and is affected by the place. The old folklore and stories of our past are a wealth of knowledge that are still relevant to this day. An example of this historic implication of people shows itself in a nondescript field next to my house. The field has the name Ankaith, which translates as the lost. It steps from the southwest down towards the northeast, with the southeastern border consisting of a double layered ditch, a place I found myself enchanted by in my youth. The ditch was created by the degradation of an old coach road that went from Dublin to Cork. By Anconi's road was a small road for you for horse drawn coaches. In the early 1800s, it was a modern form, it was the modern form of travel. This road would have been similar to an archery flowing through the area, keeping people employed and allowing goods from the area to be brought with relative, relative ease to all the major towns and markets in Munster. Halfway down the field, there is an odd flat square piece of land. And further down, it seems to be terraced, with no apparent reason for this. It was my great-great-grandfather, Patsy Hennessy, who was the first person to uncover the reason for the landscaping. He was tilling the land, making it ready for a field of potatoes, when he unearthed an ancient, burial, an ancient burial ground. This realization to him then and myself now was startling. That someone could live and farm in a place for their whole life and not know what lays beneath their feet. Feet. Time changes everything, big or small, crucial or unimportant. I have had this perception of the world since I can remember, mainly due to the stories and the landscape I grew up in. They were a continual reminder that what I was experiencing was fleeting. The youthful form of me was frightened by this, but as I grow older, I started to find charm in this fact. There is times I wonder, what was the history of the land my house is on? Will the same land that means so much to me be something entirely different in the future, with no memory of me or my people? Time can be kind or cruel. For my family, the passing of time has given the opportunity to live in this amazing landscape. This awareness that time is ceaseless and impartial is daunting. It reminds you of your own mortality and that of everything around you. This principle is difficult, is a difficult one to comprehend. My place communicates this conclusion with both visual and oral gestures, from the hidden to the obvious. The giant scars on the land of an earlier time where ice was master, to the subtle changing from a busy road to a quite listless separation between two pastures of grass. These are physical reminders of the effect time has on plays, but without the oral history, the materialistic clues will be left untouched. Oral tradition allows you to hear what people encountered and thought places a, combina a combination of all these things. One without the other would not be sufficient or as effective. It is this combination of factors for me that makes up place. They have had a, an, an immense impact on me throughout my time on earth and will, cult and will continue to do so, I have no doubt. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name's Gorkin. I'm in Ford here. Um, so I wrote, two pieces. One is about Leash, where I grew up, and the second is about Limerick, which is where I'm studying and currently living. Um, and I wrote the two in a sort of seasonal account, and it's divided up into four chapters, each chapter being a season, and then structured it in a way so that paragraphs would jump between the two places in order to create the sort of contrast between environment and I suppose, the life in them. So I'm just going to start with a um, short introduction and then read a couple of paragraphs. 
there is a shareable pride in where a person comes from, a sort of pride that when they meet another from the same place, a momentary lapse of strangeness occurs. For that brief moment, through the share of an up wherever, they can never imagine being more intimate. Yet, within that lapse of strangeness, there exists two varying perspectives of one familiarity. Place is constant, experience is fitful. Spring cracks the empty air. Some morning there will be a smell, nothing you can put your finger on, just a difference. An air of growth so subtle, calling the resting world to life. The first arrivals are shoots of grasses poking out of the fallen pine needles, decomposing along the drive. Daffodils follow in reliable fashion, clocks steadier than yours or mine, and the ditches start to put on weight again. And then it sort of switches over to Limerick. There comes a day when the heating isn't turned on. More of these days pass without acknowledgement. At some stage, the boiler switch is flicked for the last time. Winter is over and the single glazed window quietly slips down the list of things I resent. The mold recedes and the rafters dry. Transition, yeah, sorry. Transitions between home, college and work become more tolerable. However, sharp frosty nights can still catch you by surprise. Cool air falls on clear nights into the Shannon's low-lying basin, and the thick fog in early spring makes for the coldest, most mystical mornings. I am well aware I ride a bike in the winter months, but as the seasons swing, I tend to forget. I'm going to skip on now to uh, autumn. The sun sets best behind the Rock of Dunamaze now. All year it rises and falls on predictably even horizons. In September, it meets short hills just beyond Stradbury, then backlights to tree mounds with the ruined castle nestled in the middle. There's history in those hills. Excavations have found evidence of settlements as far back as the ninth century. Surely, I think, people have been there before that. If I was to choose a place to live, it would be there. Instead, I'm in Cool Row. Cool Row, an anglicised translation of Cool Rua meaning back, or sorry, cool meaning back, and rua meaning red, red back. It is a back road, a cul-de-sac, and before quilter forestry plantations, generation of coating of red turf was carried out. The simplicity of regional naming seems essential to the underlying geography. There are a handful of warm days before the winter begins. The last of the sunshine cans are sit by the river before the inevitable invasion of college work. The air gets thinner and the fingers grow numb. Numb fingers grip cold pints now. Pints as cool as the air, air not as refreshing as the pints. The experience of the town becomes nocturnal and interior. Bright hours of the diminishing days are spent confined to the studio. Excursions into the city are reserved for the purely recreational. The cavalry of taxis ride on rails to and from Castle Troy laying siege on the city center. And it jumps back to leash. Cool Row gets colourful visitors in the autumn. Young people in elderly cars often pull into our drive in dire need of direction, start towards Stradbury Hall for electric picnic. There was a hint of pilgrimage in that weekend. From an early age, I fantasised about what it was like. At night, it's go fi bass and drones carried in between the fields, abandoned bales after a likely wet summer's end. A soft white glowed on the often overcast sky like a sort of deployable mecca. Since coming of the age to partake, I'm in firm agreement with the spirituality of the festival, but my perception has slipped slightly from the religious to the all-round degenerative. And then it skips back into Limerick. We're at the peril of doormen. We get out of the taxi early and finish whatever drops of wine we manage to stow away. Then continuing up the dock road towards Dolan's, we were at the good nature of Dorman. The walls of Irishtown saw siege all the way back in 1690, Irishtown being the medieval quarter of the city, more obviously noted by its cobble roads and narrow streets. Jacobites retreated from the Battle of the Boyne. William of Orange caught up with them and attempted to breach the stone walls of King John's. It was in August 330 years ago the victory swung in the defenders' favour. 330 years ago. I wonder if 330 years from now, People who write about my failure to breach Dolan's. Thank you.
So it's now open. Thank you very much for all the thoughts. It's open to anybody to respond to whether whether we want to ask Tracy or Emer or um, leave it open to a student to respond to begin with. Um, it's up to you, James. Maybe you've met them before. <laughs> yeah, um, geez, uh, I think that would give uh, English students a run for the money. Um, I, I was interested to to hear, like, uh, because you know, architects are very visual by nature. So the idea of like, creating place by words wouldn't be, in my head, anyway. You know, you know, I'm friends with a few architects. They're just very, very visual people. But I was very impressed. Impressed, um, and there was a similarity between the pieces. This idea of kind of evoking um, the the past in terms of the ancient and the traditional with the cottages or the older buildings and with the modern and it seemed to blend very nicely and create this sense of a place that Ireland actually is you know when you walk around there is these kind of different uh, competing stories you know and sometimes people are are blind to them really um, but uh, I really got a sense of that kind of echoes of those those three things competing and I think that was really uh, really strong and I was struck by um, there was some brilliant lines there uh, you know the idea of place where I wouldn't be the same without it of like of our home place um, and the sea and the first glimpse of the sea or first glimpse of our home place and we get we all know that feeling of that that rush and um, and it really and I, I liked the, there was the imagery of uh, peel different peeling place or paints and texture came up a lot but I think you know is uh, must be a must be a and something that um, I suppose architects are looking for texture and create texture and are placemakers um, and this idea of uh, those uh, Shanna, you know, this idea of, of nearly like being like poetry, this kaleidoscopic uh, of colour, it was very kind of poetic uh, language language, and, uh, and the time, I was really struck as well uh, by what one of the pieces about this time scale of nature that we are, you know, we are only very fleeting and that that I guess, as a place, the story of a place changes um, that Patrick was talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just really, I just thought it was really, really strong pieces. Like actually, uh, each one of those pieces could be could be published like as a standalone piece. I could see see them, people would be very like interested to read because they were kind of unique and they kind of offered a unique uh, perspective, you know, and, and yeah, it was really, really strong. So. Yeah, it'd be yeah. Thanks for inviting me to to hear it. It's great, actually, Jim. You know, to have it's a kind of rounding off because because you've met these guys for a couple of hours, actually. Um, so thanks for that response and summary and thoughts. Interesting to hear what you what you what you pick out. I hadn't thought it's a nice way to describe an architect as a placemaker, actually. I think I'm 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 really impressed by how literary it is. I was just thinking, where can I get a hold of these complete pieces? Because I want to. And um, absolutely, they could be published. They are they're just so literary, and they're like that. James has picked out some some. I was just scribbling down these quotable these amazing quotes that come through it. So, um, yeah, and just this idea of history, um, and time coming through there. But I think what I'm from what I'm interested in, I and I think you just talked to there, Anna, this idea of um architects and sort of writers as producers of places and spaces and and trying to evoke those and I just think what really came across for me is sort of like your individual experiences and knowledges knowledge of place being really well communicated actually so you've really created these these physical spaces and I suppose as listeners and maybe as readers you know we can really place ourselves there as well which just came across you know there's the grains of sand, the shells passed pass down, that the, the impact of light changing over seasons, changing over time. Um, you could really feel yourself being there and experiencing these, these places as well. So I just think it was so impressive. And I, I was just thinking of um, Shelley's Ozum and Dyes as well. Is it Fionn's one? But this came through in quite a few, this idea of time and, and history kind of wiping over architecture but kind of what remains are these architectural remnants I suppose that were there as well so yeah I just I have so many notes it was just <laughs> so glad I got to <laughs> down here so um it's just been really interesting to because I look at it in terms of writers 
and, and, and reading maybe architectural theory through that, but to have architects coming at it from, from a different perspective has been, has been really valuable actually. So, so thank you. I think it was just so visceral in lots of ways as well, what came through there and, and that, that really struck me as well. So very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. This is a this is an aside observation. I realized in my um it was only just as I ever do is reading for those that have just joined us today, there are actually four. There were four female students in the other group. So um I just as a, there is a there is a gender balance. I didn't I didn't even notice that until now. I don't even I don't think in that way, basically. But it was just I should have I should have uh, broken it up a little better, but she didn't think about that. Um Imer, I don't know, maybe from 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 Norway, have you any response or thoughts? Uh, um, yeah, like Tracy, I've got loads of notes here. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to listen in on, on these um, collection of stories. Um, it was really, you all successfully transported me home. <laughs> so I'm uh, pretty homesick actually after hearing all of that. Uh, you, everyone really captured this, um, the essence of uh, the Irish landscape, whether it's the more inland places or, or coastal and, you know, light, rain, uh, wind, they were all uh, harvested in very different ways and expressed in very different ways, which was um, really refreshing to see actually these uh, uh, different descriptions. Um, th definitely there was a uh, time featured in different ways in all of these um, stories or collect recollections. Um, and it was interesting to see these um, both personal um, kind of memory actually appearing, but also collective memory, um, how people would have uh, used the landscape in different ways over time. Um, so that kind of consideration for, for place was really great to see that there are other people who use the landscape in, in very different ways in, in the past and the present. Um, and also consideration for the future, what's there that's going to inform future, um, future scenarios, um, whether that's um, an anthropogenic change that's going to happen or if it's going to be, an, you know, natural erosion along the coastal areas. Uh, so this kind of establishing relations uh, between both between all the senses, this multi-sensory engagement with the landscape or also the relationship between the earth, the sky, the past, um, the present, the future. So it was a very dense um, mesh of relations that were established very differently in all the stories. So um, definitely um, this a publication that really the photographs I need to mention as well were very evocative too. I think they were very well chosen images that um, really complemented the texts that were read so thank you very much yeah it's great that's actually something i wanted to, to say as well that the pairing with the pairing of the text with the visual even though you said at the start that it wasn't necessarily as important i thought it was really nice that the text was actually like an extension of that that visual realm like like what james was saying at the start like as architects we tend to be really visual thinkers but having having the the ability to extend that or to expand upon that because I think what's clear as well is that like the, the textual pieces have this inbuilt sense of time which you can't always get across in a visual way so I think I think it's just like that that sensory thing it's just really beautiful to see everything come together in a multifaceted way. Do any of you want to speak about your images in relation to that? Yeah, um, there's a lot of, I think for most of us, any of those, it kind of went like a double page spread where one side was picture or two and the other side was the text. And uh, I think it worked really well like that when you read through everyone's pieces, like as full pieces. Um, I wasn't sure if it would work with the one as we read our piece, but like with my images, just a general sense of how those stones are left. Kind of just wanted to get that across, but... Yeah, with the, with the larger pieces anyway, it works much, much better with the full spread. There's much more images to see, I suppose. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, I suppose the, the thing of um, image and text is a kind of maybe naughty one. And we, well, I, old, probably grew up in a world where you didn't 
mix the two and then it maybe it's become somewhat voguish to do so but it's actually quite interesting thinking about what some of you like in a way i have i didn't hear everything today but but the sort of thing of images which are looking out do you know what i mean at sort of the mountains and i'm trying to guess whether those mountains are to the south of the viewer i think they are with the quarries on so that's kind of interesting about you know that a thing can be about situating you or some of the other images are not really maybe about situating but there's something conveying something about the being of the river or the river as a protagonist coming through a place or something so actually yeah i guess the, the kind of relationship between image and text or what the images i promised today i would close my eyes as well but of course <laughs> I, I came straight in with them open <laughs> um but, he, but maybe it's interesting to maybe it is to um remove image again almost and um, because i i guess that, that, that for us as architects it is actually probably really helpful to liberate ourselves sometimes from image because we struggle so much to visualize or convey what it is we're trying to imagine and in some ways we never can <laughs> so it's a kind of a, 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 well some can i can't but so, but but so it's a kind of ultimate it's this sort of endless struggle that we're trying to say how, how can i and and how can you think it without drawing it and all of these things but actually you can think a lot of things through words and 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 convey a lot of things through words in spite of aphorisms to the contrary um so i think it's a really it's a really enjoyable um yeah and kind of exercise to undertake but it's very important for architects and it's not writing about architecture i think it's 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 for itself do you know what i mean and trying to think about place which is interesting and That's i mean exactly. i'm always yeah anyway it's and 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 sort of your feet in the place as well as your head in a way um oral history yeah that struck me there was there was something you said there about like the image was looking out and I suppose that kind of is the counterpart for what we were talking about on Wednesday of how the texts were like looking in because mm. I know we were talking about how a lot of them are written in the first person and it was sort of trying to capture the essence of an experience or something which I know you can do that through imagery but at the same time you can't you know and I think this idea that the text is looking in where the image is looking out and they sort of balance each other mm. I don't know if that's something that crossed your mind. You know, well, I think, I, well, I'm sorry, I, I'll shut up now, but it, it is this kind of interesting triangulation that with writing you can, um, well, in a way, one is always probably trying to situate, you're never really at home and you're kind of always slightly, you know, moving between, and even, um, I don't know who it was, was talking about, you know, the kind of to and fro from Limerick to, to Leash and the sort of, and the thrum of electric picnic across the air. Um, so those are things you can't convey in drawing, really. That thing that you can't see it, but you can hear it. And is it close or is it far away? And all. So I, I, I that's uh, yeah. I guess so. So actually, you can embody all sorts. You can embody all sorts of things with writing that, in a sense, you will struggle to do in imagery. Um, so I don't know that we should be so image, and maybe in this place-based world one is not so image conscious either, um, which is interesting, maybe about uh, all sorts of things. Yeah. Anyway, I'll shut up. Would you hit the nail in the head, Marcus, in terms of just, uh, just in terms of, it, it, it's not about writing about architecture, but in itself, this space, the writing as spatial in and of itself and writing maybe as architecture, even though that's a provocative comment for many uh, architects. Um, but uh, that's that's an observation. I think Just Darren the... Snyder is always really interesting about that, of, okay. of, 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 of it's not about something, it's, and nor is it the it's... thing itself, but... Yeah, okay. Actually, I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I will email you offline about that to find out where that is. Um, I, yeah, is it is. Yeah, I could offer some, just in terms of the intention, the in relationship with the image and the text, the text had to do the work, I suppose. So maybe it was, we spoke more about images as it started to be something to laid out nicely on a page, let's say, um, uh, or in some instances, it was a useful prompt um, to put oneself back in a place. Um, I don't, is there anybody else that I don't want to 
put people on the spot who haven't maybe but I see Erna smiling a lot and Jan present whether there or maybe there are other students uh, from other years that might want to respond or I don't know. I thought, I thought it was terrific yeah I, I enjoyed it greatly and you know thinking about it from London and having taught in other countries as well as Limerick I mean it's uh it's extremely unusual to actually hear pieces like this in the School of Architecture and which are so so sensitive about about place and to language. I mean I, I think in fact in my experience it's been quite unique um, and I think it's wonderful. I mean what, one of the thought which came to my mind is uh, whether I mean, or in, in what way, see, it's not, it's not a suggestion that it should be that way, but in what way um, literature could also embody a uh, so, so dimension of the project in a school of architecture and, and remain literary. Yeah. Um, so a sense of hypothesis and a sense of uh, looking towards the future. Um, I think partly because maybe the students who were writing quite often wrote about the place they come from or places which they know well. So there was a, a reflective sense in the writing and sometimes also a sense of longing. Um, and I, I wonder what it would be like to actually mirrors this sense of longing uh, in into the future 